I know of one Irish religious order which is doing well, doing extremely well. I would say because of the influence of a small number of quite remarkable priests in the order. But I've, I've been in a situation where I've complimented members of that order of about my own age, late 50s, early 60s, on how well the order is doing and been astounded to receive quite a negative reaction. Sure, they're embarrassed by it. Yeah, they think they're weirdos. It was as if I'd noticed that the, sure. you know, the, 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 the house had burned down or something. It, 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 was, it was not a good thing. Uh, the, the, the thing is, what we are left with now, you know, the wheat and the chaff and all of that stuff, I mean, it's not nice to say maybe, but, but the appeal of Catholicism to young people is that it's hard, not that it's easy. Yeah. Is that you have to make sacrifices, that you have to be prepared to do things that are in this world but not of it, and that you are going to stand out, and that you are gonna be a subject of ridicule. This has gone from sort of something that was national service to being like the Navy SEALs now. Being a, a uh, a, Roman, a young, Roman, practicing Roman Catholic now, you are an elite. <laughs> you know, not one that's celebrated by the world, one that's despised by the world, yes. which makes you even more elite. Yes. It's harder to do that than it is to be an Olympic athlete now. Yes. The in intellectual strength, the character, the attributes that you have to have as a person to be willing to do what is necessary is... Um, is extraordinary now. Do you see some of yourself in them? I mean, go back to that initiative you had, go back to that no. dream you had, to that will to lead. Uh, Do you see? No, they're better than I was. I, 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 I wasn't that, at that age, you know, I've been very lucky um, and, you know, it was interesting, I saw William F. Buckley had said the same thing about himself. I've never, I've never doubted my faith. Okay. Now, I know people grapes and Mother Teresa did, but I never have. Sure, sure. Maybe I will in the future, I don't know, but it's, it yeah. hasn't happened. Yeah. Um, call it a grace or whatever it was, I've just been lucky, I never doubted it. But I, I, I was not as curious about my faith um, at a younger age uh, you know, it, to go to the lengths that I see young people now do to be able to make sure that I was getting the most from it, mm -hmm. if you will. That came with time. They are, as you say, an elite and extraordinary people. I, I totally agree with you on that. At the same time, they are young. Um, I don't know if you agree with me, but I really do see a serious problem in the lack of sympathy for them among their elders, because the young do need that kind of encouragement. The church, the, Catholic, the future of the Catholic Church belongs to them. Yeah. Because as uh, I think it was Oriana Falacci that said in one of her books, you know, the future belongs to those who show up for it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> which is a kind of obvious observation if you think about it. Yeah. But it's, you know, okay, if you think, if, for those that think the future of the Catholic Church is in lukewarmness, yeah. and Christ talked about spitting out the lukewarm, it's, it's not there because no one's showing up for it. It doesn't, frankly, it's unappealing. It's not challenging. And what we're going to be left with, you know, the young men and the young women that are going into Catholic religious orders now aren't doing it because their mother and father are pushing them to do it. Yes. They're probably doing it where their mother and father are saying, don't do it. In my experience. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so it's a very different... Yeah. People are going in there for all the right reasons, not because M Mammy wants to have a nice ordination in the sure. parish. Yeah. And... Uh, and they're going to be, they are going to scare their elders, but their elders are going to time out. We're all here for a short time and, you know, they'll rise to the top. So are we talking about, this is genuinely terrifying to church leaders, but are we talking about the future belonging to spiritual gangs of orphans who have arisen in the rubble? <laughs> kind of, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, and they it's, won't be too easy to control. No, 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 because <laughs> look, the, you, you, what you think you're going to embarrass them yes. into? I mean, the, you can't even imagine the leaders who are afraid of this have no comprehension, not even any comprehension of the courage and the fortitude of those young people. 
they would so not be that person at a young age. And that's why it's alien to them, because it genuinely is alien. They have no grasp of what motivates somebody like that. I honestly don't think I've heard that put better, because that is, I mean, for, for some of us, some, some of us priests, these issues are constantly in our minds. You know, you're looking at this and really you're asking, and I sp I'd love to hear what you have to say on this. You, you, you see it. I mean, you see it. I mean, yeah. you know, a young person comes and kneels for communion. Yes. And the priest is getting freaked out. Yes. <laughs> he almost jumps up on a no, chair. No, it's like, <gasps> you mean this is real? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's what they mean. I think the ghost of Flannery O'Connor is smiling. <laughs> I, ta I take your point on that, all right. What's going to be left for them? Have we anything to give them? You know what? That's where we have to have faith, right? And we have to keep the faith. You and I are not going to come up with the answer. Yeah. God will provide. Um, I don't know what's going to be left for them, but I, I, I know this. I know that you, know, you don't have to walk too far from here to find an old mass rock where we said mass in the penal times. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we were reduced to that here in this country, and we came out of it with um, a very you know, vibrant faith. And I think even if we were to lose all of our properties, and, and we have to be prepared to do that, that might happen. We, the, sh the state might shut us down. A future, a future Irish state might decide to abolish the Catholic Church. It sounds, might sound ridiculous to you. Uh, you, you, you Didn't it happen in France? It did. I mean, post-revolution, oh, uh, 20th absolutely. century. Yeah, it happened yeah. just before the First World yep. War. In fact, in this house, uh, the Order of St. Camillus, who was an order of French monks, had to set up here in the uh, first, the very beginning of the 20th century because there was a persecution on in France and they were driven out of France. Yes. Um, so you don't know what's, what's going to happen, but with those young people on fire with the faith, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Christ himself said it. And uh, so we know that. Um, yeah. And, you know, he certainly had a better, I better idea of what was going to happen than any of the rest of us did. Yes, he did. Yeah. He did. I I'm sure this has happened, but let's say one or two or a group of these young Catholics were to ask you for advice in terms of how best not to waste fairly narrow opportunities immediately available to them to make a difference in the church. What advice would you give them? If they're not called to a vocation in the holy orders, um, then I would say, gosh, this is going to sound so untrendy. Get married young, have kids, and keep doing it, and bring your kids up in the faith, and nurture your family. The family is the domestic church. It's the building block of civilization. If we have a crisis, a major economic crisis, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, but if and when that comes, and I think it's more a matter of when, families are what's going to save Europe, save Ireland, save civilization, and families of faith are going to be the wellsprings through which the renewal comes. So think about your family. Don't put off having children. Don't put off marriage. Go out there and uh, invest in your family and your children and nurturing the faith in the domestic church because that's where it's going to that's where renewal is going to come from and just on this general note of interface with the secular society i know we have to be careful i accept that this is this is uh, crossing a bog in the dark as it were but uh, there is a case presently before the courts uh, is there anything at all you can say um, well, I, I can speak in, in very general terms about the case, some sort of sub judice. Some of it is obviously, I can't talk about witness statements or anything like that. But taking the case, because we believe that the ban on public worship is unconstitutional, I think it's very clearly unconstitutional. It's The Irish Constitution is almost unique in the world in the, the way that it spells out the specific right in Article 44. Uh, to participate in public worship and that the state cannot interfere with that except for in the case of to preserve public order and the bar that you have to clear to justify banning public worship in the interest of public order is an awful lot higher 
and requires evidence rather than a hunch. The threat would have to be yeah. fairly immediate. Yeah. Yeah. Immediate, obvious and provable. Yeah. And, you know, the measures that the bishops took uh, to introduce COVID mitigation, yes. um, sanitization, yes. mask wearing, you know, one-way pedestrian traffic, all of the things that they did, um, you know, Frankly, the evidence is that stuff works very, very successfully. Yeah. I was reading a report about uh, a million Catholic masses that were looked at in the aftermath of the ban be bans being relaxed in the US with the number of instances of COVID spread traced to them at being zero. Yeah. Even though there were asymptomatic people at those masses, yeah. but they, because they were wearing masks and socially distanced and everything else, um, those things, uh, there, there wasn't spread. So uh, I think the case in Scotland is very helpful to us. It's a common law country. It was found that the ban there was overreach, uh, was excessive and disproportionate. I think that there's a good chance that we end up with a similar um, uh, outcome here. Um, and the trend around the world, whether it's you know, Germany, France, Switzerland, Scotland, most recently the Supreme Court case in the US, is le leaning in that direction, that, that religious freedom, the right to participate in public worship is uh, where they are taking sensible measures to guard against uh, spread. And, you know, I mean, there are, there are risks attendant. We shouldn't pretend that there aren't. So you do have a responsibility and duty to mitigate against those risks, but you do not have to shut down public worship. You can reduce numbers, you can you know, do all of those things. That in general is the thrust of our, our, our argument, pointing to the protections in the Irish constitution, as well as things in, in the ECHR and, and whatnot. And uh, I, I, I think that we, we, we have a, a very strong case and it should prevail. Uh, how long it will take uh, you know the Irish courts are not very well resourced it's a very they're very challenged uh, with you know the lockdowns and everything else um, so how long it takes remains to be seen but uh, I think it's outrageous that the government is keeping public worship banned in the way that they are in my opinion in absolute open defiance of the rights enshrined in the Irish Constitution. Just looking at the, the broader picture in, in terms of your business and everything, what are your thoughts on the United States at the moment? How do you see things going there? My wife's American. My wife's a New Yorker, um, Italian. Her mum was Italian, God rest her soul. She's a, de a year dead now. And uh, her father, her late father, was uh, Polish-American. And uh, so very Catholic, um, yes. New York Catholic family. And uh, I love America. Um, uh, I, 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 you know, and I was brought up to love America, and I was brought up to sort of see it as the kind of the the ultimate sort of secular construct to aspire to. That post World War II afterglow of you know the America that that we, I was in my generation were brought up to love and admire. I worry for America as I see it being tortured, if you like, from the extremes on all sides. Um, and we won't have enough time here today to get into it. I continue to have faith in America's ability to self-correct. It always looks like it's going to go off at the edge. And it looks like it's going too far one way or too far the other. Yeah. But it has the remarkable thing that's built into the construct of the United States is this self-correcting mechanism that it has, the way that it balances its powers. I think the executive has got too powerful in maybe the last 20 years. Um, the Congress probably less powerful than, than it should be as a check and balance. The House of Representatives, the Senate, though, I think in hindsight, if I was going to change something in America, I would, I would look again at how the Senate is selected. I think making the Senate popularly elected was a mistake, mm -hmm. and I think it's going to. We haven't seen the full, because it's opened up all of Congress to being vulnerable to 
populism and the reason the Senate under the original construct was set up to be selected differently was another check and balance. Yes. And I think that when they removed that, and that was only done in the last century, that there was, a, a, it's like sort of taking a wheel balancing, you know, knocking, yeah. knocking a wheel off balance. <laughs> yes. You know, your tire wears out much faster over time. You don't notice it on any given day. But I think the Senate, um, if, if there's that, in terms of the management apparatus, I worry, I, I, I like the idea in some ways, I find it appealing of a popular elected Senate. It's not the way it was supposed to be, and I think it's causing problems now. Now that said, you know, Hollywood and popular culture in America detached from America's Judeo-Christian foundings, which were undeniably you Judeo-Christian, I think that that's producing some of the, frankly, the insanity that we're starting to see. Yeah. And the thing is, is will, will we self-correct from the insanity? And I like to hope that that, that, that self-correction will come, but I'm not sure. Go to the other side, so to speak. Quite the other thing. Vladimir Putin. Hero, villain, sphinx without a secret. What is he? He's the Tsar without a crown. Ah. Um, he is the... Uh, he, he wants to be the Tsar. I don't know that he's particularly looking for a crown or anything. I don't think he is. I think he... You know, he's the answer to um, the, what Russia thought it wanted in the early 1990s. I remember, and I heard this, you know, if I heard it once, I heard it a thousand times back then, where they said, we need a Pinochet. Pinochet, if you're, some of your, your viewers will know, was the dictator of Chile and um, quite brutal in many respects, but um, people will say, well, he, he stopped Chile slipping into, you yes. know, the, the sort of communist da, 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 thing. And Pinochet was somebody, you know, I was brought up to you know, be very, very fearful of and, and, and see as a, a bad guy, if you will. But yet the Russians um, of the 1990s, they, they saw their country dissolve. Um, I was only talking to somebody about this in the last few days. I mean, I, I remember, you know, top flight professionals in Russia who were academicians, you know, professors, um, senior engineers, everybody worked for the state because everything was state-owned in the communist system. People who had, were retired, who would have had a, a good pension, um, who were on the breadline. Their, their pension, their monthly pension at that point had become enough maybe to buy one loaf of bread. That was it. And so they were trying to, you know, struggling to make ends meet. They would do interpreter, you know, anything to, to try and put food on the table. And, uh, and they saw law and order just collapse and mafias rise up and the, the, the you know, I, I remember being on one flight um, in Russia. We were going somewhere in Southern Russia. I don't even remember where exactly it was now. We're in one of the Moscow airports. And this mafioso just gets up and starts telling people where to sit on the plane. And the flight team just stood there and didn't say anything because they were terrified. Imagine, you know, you spend your whole career, you're an intellectual, you're a top engineer, a you know, professor or whatever, and now there's some, very obviously, a thug ordering you where to sit on a plane or telling you where to stand in a line to get something you see law and order disappear, it creates an opening for somebody that it will promise to re-establish it. We saw it with Napoleon yes. in post-revolutionary France. Yes. How does Napoleon get to you know, rise to the heights that he did? Because the, that gap existed. So Putin is not Napoleon, thank God. Um, he is the strong man that Russia wanted, whether, you know, the Navalny's of this world are what Russia really wants, or is that just a kind of uh, an elite, 
you know, that a liberal elite in Russia that wants the Navalny, or is it really what the people of Vologda and, mm. you know, uh, 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 the, and deep Russia really want? I don't know. Do you think he has given any view to a succession? Like, uh, he, he hardly intends a, a physical dynasty, a blood dynasty. I, I, no, I, it doesn't look like it. Um, the, I think he lost the run of himself a, a, okay. a bit. I, 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 I know people that knew him and that said that he lost the run of him, really lost the run of himself once he got divorced. Um, I've After a long marriage. I've heard that from somebody who, who his view I would trust. I think he's torn. I think he's torn. Russia's a hard place to hold together. It is an empire. Yes. I mean, when you fly across that place, I've flown from Moscow to, uh, to the far, you know, to, to almost to Vladivostok. Mm -hmm. It's shockingly huge, that place yes. is. The fascinating thing to me is how Putin has co cozied up to Xi Jinping's China um, because that is in my view, by far and away, the greatest threat to Russia is, is Xi Jinping's China. I, I, you know, they could annex a, bit, a huge chunk of Russia, and I don't know that there's a whole lot that, that today's Russia could do about it. And I don't think that that's the beyond po the possibility of, of happening at some point in the future. So Putin's got, got some big challenges uh, ahead, and his, I think his main challenge is to his east and south and you know i think he probably is hoping that he can hold on for another 20 years and that something will show up i i think that if if he thought that he could re-establish um a a constitutional monarchy in in russia um with the where the monarchy would have um something more traditionally orthodox in the russian sense of a relationship with church and state that he would do it I think he has concluded that Russia needs a cultural linchpin. Yeah, he's played with, you know, sort of nostalgia for, you know, patriotic Red Army, World War II sure. Russia. He's toyed with, he's got to make his mind up which Russian history is he going to embrace. Mm -hmm. And I think he's had a problem doing that. And I think the fact that he's a checker man that he's of the KGB is a problem um, because I think that that uh, you know I think people that have been in it and have served in it I think it does a lot of damage to them. You know I'm giving an imperfect, inexact answer. No, it's very interesting because that's about where it is right now yeah. with Russia. Yeah. Uh, so some Irish Catholics, uh, some would see. Uh, Russia, for some reason, bypassing Poland, but they would see Russia as a kind of a last redoubt, a um, sort of helm's deep of, of Christianity. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that that is probably... I don't want to pass judgment on Russia. I don't know. I mean, it's there are moments where I kind of... almost sort of spine-tingling moments where you think, oh, my goodness, where you think of where it came from. Yes. So uh, I think it was about three or four years ago. I can't remember exactly when it was now, but... It was the um, the you know, vic the World War Two victory parade. It used to be the, the 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 equivalent of what was used to be the May Day parade. So the May Day parade, when I was a kid, was this big communist parade of missiles and tanks and troops and everything else. But this was what replaces it. This big military parade, and I watched it, and the 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 limousine comes out from under that archway, the Kremlin, and it's got the supreme commander of the yes. Russian Federation forces or whatever and he comes out from under that thing and he's standing up in his limousine and he's about to do the re review of the re review of the troops he takes off his hat and he blesses himself I've seen it yes yeah it's quite dramatic I was like <laughs> I mean when you think about all those nights we kneel down praying for the conversion of Russia and this is I mean there is, there is no western military commander that could do that no. And get away with it. No. I mean, they would be, you know, they'd be in huge trouble, you know, because they were showing... They'd whatever. be in private the next yeah, day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it, it just, it was so striking. But we've got to be careful because how much of this is theatre okay. and how much of it is 
truly embracing the message of Christ. Understood. Um, and that's always been the challenge of, of the Orthodox Church, right? Mm. I mean, this, we, you know, we go back to yes. Constantinople, is the interlinking of church and state in the Greco-Russian Orthodox yeah. tradition um, is, it's, it's too close. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard that Scott Hahn initially did look at the Orthodox. Yeah. Uh, and interestingly, he said he felt you simply had to be Russian or Greek. Yeah, well, they don't have any theology. I mean, it, 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 if, if you really look at it, it's like the theology is whatever, you know, the emperor says it is. There we go. We need a theology that sometimes will challenge the emperor. So he can go nowhere without a clutch of divines at his, at right, his shoulder. Right, <laughs> Advising him. <laughs> um, you've mentioned China. As, as, we, as we draw to a close, I, I think it's inescapable that we talk a little bit more about it. Russia has reason to be afraid. Do we? Oh, absolutely. Yes, we do. You do. We've reason to be, we should be afraid of ourselves first and, uh, and our own, um, ten, the human tendency to, uh, and the tendency of majorities once they become majorities to oppress minorities and the threat to the Socratic um, approach to debate, um, the contest of ideas, the competition of ideas, the creation of safe spaces, all of these things are um, an anathema to what made the West great, that made us great thinkers, great inventors, innovators, challengers of the status quo. What we are at risk of is falling to our own um, uh, risk aversion, chronic risk aversion, risk to engage with ideas, risk to acknowledge our own cultural past, our willingness to lie about it, uh, to suit you know, trendy narratives today, to be dedicated followers of fashion to a point that we bring about our own cultural extinction is something that we are at greatest risk of. Where China is concerned, uh, and in particular Xi Jinping's China, uh, communist China, is that it sees these maladies in the West as its opportunity and is ruthlessly exploiting them. You know, in, in the West, we learn to play chess and, and, and in China, they learn to play this game called Go, where you basically envelop and surround. It's not about taking pieces, it's about enveloping and denying territory and space uh, to your enemy until there's nowhere left uh, to, for, 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 for your opponent to go and you've got them completely enveloped and, and, and surrounded. And uh, I, I think a really interesting read um, in this day and age is Sun Tzu. Yes. Because we are seeing Xi and the Communist Party cadres playing out Sun Tzu's um, strategies really in textbook, fas in textbook fashion. Yeah, it's avoid conflict where you can avoid it. It should always be the very, very last thing that you can do. And the best victories that you can win are the bloodless ones where you don't actually have to fight. And so what they've done, and it's about exploiting your enemy's weaknesses, your opponent's weaknesses. And we have a lot of weaknesses and they are exploiting them uh, to their fullest extent. The fact that our business cadres are so captured by crony corporatism by protectionism, by uh, a cronyism that is detached from charity. The, the reason that we've got so much, such a spate of corporate wokeness right now is that actually those companies don't believe anything. They're not patriotic. They don't believe that the West has got better ideas than, or that you know, Christianity or Judaism, they don't believe anything. They only believe in money. And when you don't believe in anything, you're anybody's. And you know, the CEOs of the post-World War II generation were very, very different to the CEOs of today. Um, you know, founder CEOs, frankly, entrepreneur CEOs are very, very different from the sort of you know, managers um, who are really risk averse 
and apparatchiks. apparatchiks rising to the top and virtue signaling when you know that you know they actually don't believe any of that stuff you know if they believed half of the stuff they virtue signal why aren't they speaking out against the the genocide of the uyghurs in in xinjiang yeah. uh, w w why is that not something that's of concern to volkswagen mm -hmm. or or to you know and pick your company these are uh, and China has been brilliant. I've seen it in my own industry in telecommunications, but we're up against Huawei and others. I mean, the way that they have operated has just been phenomenal um, in, in playing the vulnerabilities and weaknesses of our own system against us. The future of Christianity in China? I think China... Fairly fraught, is it? Well, yes, short term, very much so. My very good friend, uh, Jimmy Lai, convert to Catholicism. Um, his wife is uh, Teresa, she's phenomenal. I mean, one of the great Catholics that I know, and Jimmy's one of the great Catholics that I know, um, he's in prison now in Hong Kong, and he may never come out again. He's, uh, he's the St. Thomas More of China, uh, of today's China. China. He, uh, he wouldn't leave. I talked to him, I was with him in London a couple of years ago, and I said, well, why are you gonna go back? I mean, you, know, you don't need to do this. This guy's you know, extremely wealthy very very successful and he said how can i how can i flee how can i leave and live in my nice house in london or in america or wherever he wants to be anywhere he said how can i do that when those young people have got yes, nowhere yes, to run yes he said they can't flee he said i have to go back yes and it reminded me of you know st thomas more he could have gone to france he could have gone anywhere yes um but he didn't he went to the tower of london um, and Henry VIII sent him there, but he knew that's what was going to happen. Yes. Um, but he stuck with it. He stuck with his country. He stuck with his people. And uh, and Jimmy Lai is uh, he's a really a, a martyr of our time. Yes. Really authentically a Catholic martyr. And um, and Cardinal Zen is another. I mean, you know, the one of the truly most outstanding uh, Catholic witnesses of our time and clergymen of our time. And um, his heroism is, it's just astonishing to me to see Cardinal Zen and his willingness to take on the power of the Communist Party of China and, and not just, and, and, and all of those who are kowtowing to the Communist Party of China, including those in our own church, um, that there's Cardinal Zen being this just outstanding witness uh, for the faith. And uh, so I think China, I was at Mass in, there's a church in downtown Washington, D.C., um, in a, what's now a Chinese neighborhood. And um, I was at Mass there one Sunday morning. I don't know, I, I, you know, I missed it somewhere else, or whatever, but it was afternoon. I think it was early, maybe one o'clock in the afternoon. Yes. And I, I ended up going to this Mass. It was all Chinese people yes. and a Chinese priest. And at that Mass, I really felt I saw the future of the Catholic Church. People on fire with the faith, a priest who clearly was as a Catholic priest should be. And it did what it said on the tent. Exactly. And I had been to Mass. Yes, yes. And I was at Mass with people who were, they knew what persecution was. And it was really inspiring. And I, I felt actually Xi Jinping missed something here. And it, it, because I know that it was something that the Chinese were looking at in that post Tiananmen era where it hadn't decided whether China was gonna be a soldier or a philosopher or a diplomat or a businessman. As I heard one Chinese guy put it to me once, China could easily decide in a Constantinian fashion that it's gonna be Christian. And if it does, the world will never be the same again. And that might happen because it's looking for an identity and it's going to find, as every communist regime has always found, that communism as a state religion is something that is built on a giant lie. And China sees its future as being one of the world's truly great powers. 
and I think it probably will be, it certainly can be, and I think if it embraces Christianity, it will be the most powerful uh, influencer in the world, bar none. It's um, a breathtaking vision. What form of Christianity? I know, I know we're into deep water here. I, mean, I, I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, uh, 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 but I think if it, if it does, yeah. what Christianity did for Europe and what it did for America, um, it can do for China, and it can probably do it more spectacularly for China if China decides to embrace it. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying this will happen. I'm saying it could happen, and that China is capable of making a pivot like that. And it's capable of looking back across the passage of time, the eras of history, and seeing, I mean, okay, you can take the sort of the Gibbons view of Christianity in the Roman Empire, which is that's what ended it. It's not, it's what saved it. It's what yes. reformed it. It's what produced Europe. And we tend to forget it continued in Byzantium for yeah, a thousand exactly, years. Exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, yes, it was a restructuring and a reorg, but but it. I mean, look what came out of it. Yes, I remember interesting. But, but the you... Communist Party of China, it, it has to be overthrown. Jimmy Lai, I mean, has written about this in the in in the, he did an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. The Communist Party of China. I'm not saying the people in the Communist Party of China, because they're cap that, you know, some of them are capable of reform. The Communist Party of China um, is holding China down. It's got its jackboot on the throat of the Chinese people. Mm -hmm. It has them enslaved. They might be you know, comfortable, but they are enslaved. And I'm not saying that China needs to become Hollywood. Mm. You know, God forbid. Yes. <laughs> I, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Exactly. But the Communist Party of China is, as an entity, is evil. It is evil, and it exacts evil, and it is irreformably evil, and that's something that China needs to throw off or reverse out of, however it does that, but it needs to part ways with communism. Yes. Because communism constrains and restrains China, it does not unleash the energy, the vitality and the brilliance of the Chinese people. Yes. Coming back to home and finding a, a, a clearing in the forest where we can land this craft, let's say you're an Irish bishop, newly minted, first three decisions. <laughs> uh without having to leave Ireland. Um, <laughs> I mean, me now. <laughs> there may be difficulties at the airport. <laughs> I tell you what, I, I'd start with some really, really basic things, okay? In, uh, in the mass leaflet, I would, I would put in instructions. Mm -hmm. Kneel, stand, sit. <laughs> so the liturgy is central. Before everything else, get it right, fix it. Um, I'm not going to say there's liturgical abuses, and there are some, but let's, let's, you know, there is, there is a right way to do it, and there is, and everything else is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and so let's just get the basics fixed first. Yeah. Let's not have the, a, a you know, good, faithful congregation saying half the mass with the priest. Let's not do that. It, they mean well. They want to pray. They're not supposed to say half the consecration. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, so just tell people. They're not going to be offended. It's yeah. okay. These are just things that little... They, so so yeah. it's about getting fit, yeah. okay? It's like, like me, right? I'm you know, eating too many Easter oh, eggs right. and too many mince pies at Christmas and everything yeah. else. You know, we've got to get fit again. Yeah. Uh, so let's start by, you know, just fixing those things. You can do that in your first week. Let's... Get the liturgy right. Let's make sure that, that the Eucharist is put back at the center of everything. Let's, you know, where we can make our, beautify our churches and make them look a little bit less yes. uh, like a 70s disco. Let's there do that. There we go. You yep. know? Um, and, you know, and some churches are hard to fix in, in, in that regard, but there's always something you can yes. do. Beauty is very important, yes. especially to the uncatechized. And we're all uncatechized in Ireland now. 
and let's put beauty back at the center of the liturgy. Yeah. A beauty that is challenging, yeah. a beauty that requires an act of surrender. Yeah. Let's not pretend that we've got all the answers because we don't. Yet your yes mean yes and your no mean no. Yeah. We can't explain everything. One of the most magnificent things about the Catholic faith is that it requires faith, that you actually have to surrender the intellect at a point, yeah. that you have to acknowledge that God is greater than you and you are never going to understand him. Yes. And there seems to be a belief that we can explain things. And I think the dumbing down, we've got to stop that like immediately. Yeah. It's so unappealing. It doesn't actually help anybody. Mm -hmm. So fix the liturgy first. Okay. That would be my fir the first thing I would I think do. think Benedict the 16th would be very much on that page with you. Um, yeah. Maybe so. Um, yeah. but, but fix that first. And then, and there's a very important role between church and state. But, you know, sometimes, um, you know, we're not, we're not the Russian Orthodox Church. We can have an adversarial relationship with the state yeah. when it's necessary to do that. Yeah. That's okay. And there are times when we need to do that. Yeah. And it's going to be better for everybody if we're, if we're open and honest about it and show a bit of backbone, a bit of spine. We're no longer the nation at prayer. No, 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 no. I mean, I, I, I was quoted in the Irish Independent the other day uh, on Saturday and I read it. When you read it in print, you think, well, maybe I shouldn't have quite said it that strongly. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I said that uh, something along the lines of that, that yeah, the Irish establishment church, yeah, the Irish church thought it was part of the establishment yes. and it took it a long time to realise that it's not part of the establishment, that the establishment hates the Catholic church. Yes. And it does. Yeah. <laughs> it really, it doesn't, it's, it's not ambivalent. Yeah. It hates it. Ambivalence is something we should aspire to. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not there right now. <laughs> and so yeah. operating on that, in that knowledge, yes. speaking out and standing up and um, pushing back. You know, Christ went into the temple and turned tables upside down yeah. and scattered the money changers coins and cast them out. Yeah. And there are times for that. Yeah. And if these aren't those times, I don't know when they are. Yeah. And people re will respect it. Your enemies will respect it. Nobody likes a chicken, yeah. <laughs> you know? Okay, so you start with the liturgy, you go outside of the liturgy quite logically to, the, uh, let's say, re relations with the state. You start drawing lines in the sand. You start maybe yeah. writing in the sand. Third, you may be buying your own pints for some time. <laughs> <laughs> um... I think that, that uh, there are, I, I, and I'm saying this on your program, Father. Third, I w actually wouldn't like to say, here I am talking about spines and backbones. I have to know my place. I am a layman and I'm you know, a bottom rung of the ladder Catholic. I have um, my own duty of obedience. Uh -huh. It's not easy for me. No. Obedience is not easy for me. No. Um, it does not come naturally. <laughs> <laughs> and there are thoughts that I have with regard to the Catholic Church in Ireland that I need to keep to myself. Okay. Um, because I have to be obedient. I can pray that yes. they happen. Yes. But th what I think actually doesn't matter. Fair enough. I know optimism, just simple optimism, isn't, isn't what we operate with. We operate with hope, and I know you have hope. To be very clear, I am, I'm hugely optimistic. I, I mean, I, I'm a natural optimist anyway. Show me a dry glass and I'll tell you, we, we, can, we can make that half full. Yes. When you're a believing Catholic, I mean, we have this enormous advantage. This is like insider trading. Yes. We're the ultimate insider traders. Yes. We know how this ends. It's like we've seen the end of the movie, we know how this ends. We know God has already won. He is risen. Yeah. And the rest of it's just going to be what the, what the score was at the end. Uh, you know, what, what's the tally in the, the war for souls? Yes. And uh, I'm very optimistic. I'm very optimistic. 
And I'm optimistic for Ireland. I have great hope for this country. I have great hope for Catholicism in Ireland. I, you know, look, we're going to have our bumps in the road. We're going to have our challenges. Ireland's going to have its challenges, but it's going to be okay. Declan Ganley, thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Father.